The UDR cast is not affiliated and does not represent any 12-step fellowship. I, Bill Ward, the host of the UDR cast, will be sharing my experience and my journey of recovery. That does include, but is not limited to, the literature contained in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 Steps. Our guests will be sharing their own path to recovery and what has worked for them. The UDR cast encourages and supports all paths to recovery. Welcome everybody to the UDR cast. UDR stands for Uncover, Discover and Recover. My name is Bill Ward and I'm coming to you from the recovery capital of Canada, Calgary, Alberta. Here we are going to discuss everything recovery, different perspectives, different experiences, both with the people I know and with others from around the world. If you resonate with anything you've heard on this episode today, we ask that you share it with anyone who you think may benefit from it. If you have any questions or comments, please find us at billward.life and send us a message in the info section. We'll get back to you as soon as we can. If you are interested in more recovery content, you can find the buttons for the YouTube channel and other social media outlets on the homepage, and you will be redirected to those platforms. We can recover, one person, one family, one community at a time. Middle of the page on 69. Okay, so last week we finished off with the one, two, three, four, five columns, right? And then I didn't go any further? Okay, sorry, you guys. So once we did that five column relationship inventory and we kind of saw where we were selfish, dishonest, inconsiderate, we had watched where we were, uh, you know, aroused jealousy, suspicion, bitterness, where were we at fault in these relationships? Kind of like the fourth column in the resentment. What's my part? Where was I at fault in my own relationships? And what should I have done instead? All very important information that tells us the truth about ourselves, especially that fourth column information on where were we at fault? Because that's really important. Where am I at fault in my own relationships? If I don't see that, then I won't fucking see the truth. I'm still going to blame other people. So the next paragraph. In this way, so we just looked at it all. In this way, we tried to shape a sane, sound ideal for our future sex, sex life. So what I do at this point when I'm sponsoring is I'm like, okay, here's your homework. You're going to write out. And I'll usually say something like, I want a 10-point list of what you're looking for in a partner and why I say 10 is because it's easy to deal with if you write out a 10 point list of what you're looking for in a partner then you can break it down into percentages so in this way we tried to shape a sound ideal for our future sex life and so we're not talking about sex here okay we're talking about relationships we're talking about principles spiritual principles or fucking like human principles or aspects of what you're looking for in somebody else so for me when i did my first one i wish i would have brought mine um you know my most recent one was like you know if i'm in the program and i'm gonna date someone in the program there's some certain criteria that has to be there and for you guys in the program if you're gonna date in the program it's a good idea to have some of this criteria in there okay <laughs> Fucking, they have to be a minimum of a year sober. Minimum. They have to be 12 stepped. They have to be working with others. And they have to have a relationship with God. And they have to have a sponsor. And they have to be sponsoring. Those things are fucking vital to a relationship in recovery with other people in recovery. Okay. They gotta be 12 stepped. They gotta be working with others. They got to have a relationship with God. They have to have one year of sobriety in at least. And there was one more that I'm missing. Um, have a sponsor and be sponsoring. Have a sponsor and be sponsoring. Then you know they're working a real program. 
So those things are like really vital for a successful relationship in recovery. Okay? And then like, let's say you're going to, and then the person isn't in recovery. They're not in recovery. Now we go more with the spiritual values. Okay, maybe the person needs to be employed. They need to have no emotional disturbance in their life. And by that, I mean, they can't have like somebody that has died that they were really close to in the last six months. They can't have lost a kid or a dog. These things are important. Trust me. Are those more points? Sorry. <laughs> These are points that have nothing to do with like the rooms. They're just like general principles for maybe a non-alcoholic, but it can also fall into somebody that is an alcoholic, right? So no emotional disturbances. Um, they have to like be kind, <laughs> loving, um, what else? Spiritual component to their life. When yeah. They're in here. Yeah. Spiritual component to their life. Maybe they don't have to go to church or whatever, but you know, you got to use your best judgment sometimes. Humor. humor. Maybe you want humor, right? Maybe you don't want someone that takes themselves so seriously. Maybe you don't want an uh, workaholic. You know, like there's things that you have to look at in your own life and what it is that you want. And then you list these things, 10 of them at least, right? Maybe seven, whatever. But they're important items to list. So in this way, we tried to shape a sane, sound ideal for our future sex life. So we're trying to shape this thing. We subjected each relationship to the test. Was it selfish or not? Don't worry about that. We asked God to mold our ideals and help us live up to them. So in this process, again, it says we ask God to help us mold our ideals. The thing with our society is, is we have a shopping list of what we think we want. Blonde hair, big tits, nice ass, right? Or with the women, maybe it's, you know, good job, nice truck, blah, blah, blah. That's not what we're talking about. That is not what we're talking about. It's not a shopping list. Not on Amazon picking out people. Right. So it says we ask God to help us mold our ideals. Again, so it says turning to God. And we're talking about directions. It says you ask God. So you take a minute. And whatever you're doing in writing this out, you sit back and you ask God. And those answers will come to you, right? Then you write them down. Um, and help us live up to them. We remembered always that our sex powers were God-given. Therefore, good, neither to be used lightly or selfishly, nor to be despised or loathed. So I just did a step five with somebody yesterday. She was a woman. It's the third section of her step five that I did. And she was using her sex and her body and her looks um, selfishly for fucking years. Using her looks and her, and her ass and her tits and all of this stuff to fucking get what she wanted, man. Whether it be money, whether it was attention, whatever. We do not use our bodies and our sex for that type of reason. That's totally selfish. That's not what we need to do here. But we learn these behaviors, so you know, but she can't do that because that shit will take her right back to the drink. Nor to be despised or loathed. So that's the other part. Sometimes we can despise or loathe our, our sex and what we've done in sex. And, it, and it, you know, we're not proud of it or whatever. But we got to try to, you know, follow this, what it says here. And then, so we have our ideal and it's written out, okay? And then it says, whatever our ideal turns out to be, so it's insinuating, I have it written out, we must be willing to grow towards it. So now, it just flipped it on you. It said, write out what you want, so you did, because you're looking for some tangible good qualities that are spiritual really at the heart of it all. Because everyone wants like fucking God-centeredness. They want to be loved. They want respect. They want kindness. So we write that out because that's what we want. And then it says, now we be willing to grow towards this. 
So now it's not about what it is in them. It's now you live up to this. You live up to what you just wrote. Why? Anyone? Water? Needs water. Finds its own level. Mm -hmm. When you can live what you've just wrote and you've risen your level of consciousness because you're working with love and kindness and integrity, then you find somebody with love, kindness and integrity. When you're living down here in fear and selfishness, you find other people in fear and selfishness. And then fear and selfishness are based in fucking ego. So what happens? Fucking ego fucking combats itself and it fucking always fails. But when you're working up here in these higher levels of spiritual principles and relationships, actually it's within yourself. Then you, you find somebody else who's secure in themselves. And you don't need to overlap out of codependency. You just stand straight together and you walk the road together and you learn together. Right? And, and it's not always a fight. It's based on vulnerability. So, <clears throat> so whatever our ideal turns out to be, we must be willing to grow towards it. And the thing is, is as you have your list, that you have your 10 points, You'll get into these relationships where someone will be flirty or whatever. And then you start developing like some kind of a connection and you're like, fuck, this feels good. This feels good. But remember, you got to remember as an alcoholic addict, you're a relief seeker, right? And when things feel good, you want more of that shit, right? And, but then you pull out your list and you're like, this guy or this chick only checks off four boxes. <laughs> and then what happens is like hello. right had you had hello yeah. and now the sponsee who wanted to do this so fucking thoroughly now does starts call stops calling their sponsor or calls him but doesn't tell him like he's been talking to this chick for like two months on the side and that then the dishonesty kicks in right because the person knows they shouldn't go there. And now the instincts are fucking pulling them powerfully towards that. And then the dishonesty kicks in. And then the dishonesty bleeds into the other areas of life. And then once the dishonesty's bled in, the ego's reasserted itself. God has been pushed away. And now the relationship carries on. And now he has to expose it. And now it's for real. And let's say I'm the sponsor. I'd be like, what the fuck? Where'd that come from? It's been like three months you've been working on this? Fuck. But you can tell when you're working with these guys how like much bullshit they're dealing with. Because as you ask questions, their pride gets really defensive. <laughs> and you just learn how to do this shit. And then you're just good at it, right? And I haven't met anyone, you know that's able to fucking connect with God and like really in their first year for sure. Like for real. Second year, you can get better at it. In your third year, okay, maybe you're not calling your sponsor as much because you have a fucking genuine connection because you've cleared so much shit out of the way. But that's three years in. You know, that first year, there should be constant fucking discussion with your sponsor in your life it's, or that fucking process of learning about self doesn't happen so you know important information man for long-term recovery and actually being vital like the vitality that we can have in recovery not just important to stay sober but important to lift our lives up and have like really good vibrant lives where we create a life where we don't ever want to fucking lose that there's there's a lot of things that you can bring as value forward but, like, you wouldn't have drank if there was, if all the pieces were in place. It was probably dishonesty somewhere. It's probably a defect that you weren't willing to fucking tell someone about. Or maybe a couple. It's probably fucking women for sure. Fucking porn, nice. gambling. Who knows? I don't know. But, right. Well, it talks about... To, to be willing to grasp and develop a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. Learning how to grasp and develop a manner of living which demands it 
is not fucking easy. We learned we had to concede to our innermost self we were alcoholics. We learned we had to concede to our innermost self that we're fucking dishonest and that, and that I need to fucking out myself. Like learning these things and grasping and developing the manner of living, which demands it, dude. It demands it. And if you're not doing that part, the dishonesty is so important. I mean, the honesty is so important. <laughs> But you can really see that dishonesty and how cunning it is. Yeah. And sometimes you didn't even really notice it. Yeah. And other times you did. And, and lied to myself and others about it. Right. <laughs> Which is the importance of following the step 10 process to a fucking T. Well, a treatment center step 10 is about doing an inventory at night. After the day's end. Yeah. Right. That's, that doesn't... It's not by mistake treatment centers aren't keeping guys sober. And that's one of the fucking right. biggest reasons because step 10 is one of the most important ways or aspects to be sober and turn over self. And by you doing a nightly inventory after you've ran your fucking day all day and yeah. fucking doing an inventory and sitting there and rationalizing, justifying in your own mind, your own shit, good luck. No, and, and that's good. And, and use them. But there is... There is a lot of value in using God-centered 12-step sponsors that understand like what we're talking about. So for me, I use sponsors, pillars, and I use spiritual advisors. And which with, can be, which, can be elders. which is elders for sure. Yeah. Right. And some fuck, I was using a Christian guy for a while too, right? And it doesn't really matter. Who, who it is, but it's really advisable if you're working a 12-step program that you use 12-step pillars and sponsors. It doesn't have to be a sponsor. 12-step pillars are cool too if your primary person is an elder. But elders don't really understand like all the self stuff and it's pretty cunning. So it's, it's pretty good to have that knowledge from somebody that gets it. Anyway, I'm going to finish this piece on uh, sex conduct, so let's keep going. Uh, wait, wait. Can we go for it? Yes. <laughs> okay, so bottom paragraph, page 69. Whatever our deal turns out to be, we must be willing to grow towards it. We must be willing to make amends where we have done harm, which would come in step eight, nine, provided that we do not bring about still more harm in doing so. In other words, we treat sex as we would any other problem. In meditation, so it's telling you, here's some direction. In meditation, we ask God what we should do about each specific matter. That'll be at step eight and nine. But it says in meditation to do this. The right answers come if we want it. Notice how he writes if we want it. Because some of us aren't willing to let go of some of these behaviors. And so we're not going to get the answer because we're not willing to hear the answer because we're still resisting it because our old behaviors still want what it wants. God alone can judge our sex situation. Counsel with other persons is often desirable. That's important. So God alone can judge. But if you're the sponsee that says, oh, me and God, we decide everything for me fucking good luck you're gonna be hurting a lot of people you're gonna be burning down your life in many areas and it says it for a reason per discussions with other people is desirable that's like important man right and the person that you're talking with they're not judging you they're fucking there to help you and guide you and call you out on your bullshit but we let god be the final judge we realize that some people are as fanatical about sex as others are loose. We avoid hysterical thinking or advice. Suppose we fall short on the chosen ideal and stumble. Does this mean we're going to get drunk? Some people tell us so, but it is only a half truth. It depends on us and our motives. That's the truth right there. <coughs> depends on you and your motive. And are you really willing to grow in the image and likeness of your creator? Are you really willing to fucking change? After you've seen what your fucking issues are, are you willing to take you to have God take you to better things? That's what it's talking about. If we are sorry for what we have done 
and we have an honest desire to let God take us to better things, we believe we will be forgiven and will have learned our lesson. If we are not sorry and our conduct continues to harm others, we are quite sure to drink. So if your conduct doesn't change and you continue to harm others, whether it's intentionally or not doesn't fucking matter, right? Because if you're not doing, if you don't do the steps and see how self is fucking you and you keep living with intention, you're still going to hurt people. So there's so many people that come in here and, and just think that they've lived like this perfect life that they've been so giving and forgiving and they're nice and, and all these things. And how can I be selfish? And then when they actually did the work, they're like, holy fuck, am I ever selfish? Am I, have I ever been a manipulator? Have I ever fucking tried to manipulate everybody with my self-pity and my fucking shit? Like the this, this stuff doesn't come until you put it pen to paper, right? So people that have never done a sex conduct might not even understand what we're talking about here. Because never, no one really, you know, in most cases, no one really wants to hurt somebody else, right? But it says here, if, you're, if your conduct continues to harm others, and that conduct is just conduct you've been living with unintentionally trying to hurt people, but if it continues... We are quite sure to drink, it says. Whether your intention is to hurt or not, you will fucking drink. Why? Anyone? Because it's a manifestation of self. And when the self runs the show, we succumb to the desire and we don't have a fucking choice. We pick up the drink. <coughs> we are not theorizing. These are facts out of our experience. So I've done enough step fives and worked with enough sponsees and you guys know my buddy Jesse and I are tight. When it says we are not theorizing here, we just had someone on my podcast ask us recently, what's the number one reason why people relapse? Number one, hands down, relationships, sex. Hands down. You want to fucking relapse? Go get in a relationship in your first year. You want to relapse? Keep watching porn in your first year. Because it'll drive you to a relationship. Guaranteed. It's the number one reason why people relapse. And in this lesson, you know, it talks about um, have learned our lesson. That's what we're trying to do is learn our lesson. And sometimes these lessons aren't learned right away, right? And I'll give you this other little bit of information before I finish this page. So I read a lot of other books and I study a lot of other material um, in spirituality. And I found this book. It was called. Ah, uh, oh fuck. I can't remember. Anyway, but in this book, it talked about the sex madman is no different than the dope madman. And it talked about the desire for sexual energy, that desire of energy that we have in us because we're all energy, right? And we all have the desire for sex in us and it's the most powerful of all energies a human being has. And it said, when this energy is fucking released in a purely physical form, it depletes will willingness and willpower. So if you come into recovery... And your fucking bullseye is, I need to stay sober. And that's the red dot in the middle of your bullseye. That's what you should be going for. But the thing is, is when you put the drink and the drug down, your disease is still alive. It needs fucking its, its exit out of you somehow. It can't get it through drink. It can't get it through drugs. You know you're fucked if you pick up. So now the number one way that it wants out is through sex relationships. And then when you release that energy that is in you in a purely physical form, so now you have sex, you have just re depleted your willingness and your willpower. So that bullseye target that you were going for now becomes really fucking foggy. And it's actually not the target anymore. But your brain and your ego can think that it still is because that's why you came here. But the, in your physiology within your body, it fucking now makes it like really ziggy and zaggy and that target is no longer the fucking bullseye. Can you still get the target to the target even if this is happening? Some can. Some can? Okay. But probably not you. 
question. And, and, April, I'm eight months. and I didn't mean you in particular. No, I meant no. any anyone who asked that question. No, I know. I'm just, I just, right? I just want to know. Right. Can I do it? But, but, the, but the, the thing... The thing that if I answer yeah, then everyone will fucking be that one person. Right? But the other thing about this energy is when you harness it and you fucking focus it to something purposeful, then it br brings about fucking power and energy and, and focus like never before in your life. So to take the energy and harness it and use it to something purposeful actually rises you in ways that you can't really comprehend. So the examples of this is like when sports teams are going for like Stanley Cups or Super Bowls and shit, usually the coaches say no sex and we're taking you away from your family actually so you can't even Not fuck your way. Not to be sadistic? Huh? Not to be sadistic. No. <laughs> to, to do what I said, right? So that they can win that cup. So they're focused on this purpose, this goal. And so for us, the goal is sobriety. But later, once you pass sobriety, the purpose is character. The purpose is God's will, right? Living in these spiritual principles. And that's why here in the big book, it says... To sum up, about, sum up about sex, we earnestly pray for the right ideal, for guidance in each questionable situation, for sanity and strength to do the right thing. If sex is very troublesome, which it often is, we throw ourselves the harder into helping others because it has purpose and we're harnessing the energy into something good. And it's actually our recovery and it's actually working towards altruism. Um, we throw ourselves the hard into helping others. So for me, my sponsor told me when I was struggling with this, like years and years ago, first, second year, he's like, you got to go help others, man. Go fucking help others. Because I was outing myself, right? I've been pretty good at outing myself with my sponsor most of the time, but not all the time. And he told me, go do that. So I listened to him and I went and did that. And it cured the imperious urge. And it fucking gave me a lot of strength and willingness to move forward. I prevent you from working efficiently on yourself and your own programming balance? Working with others? No. I don't think so. But, but the ego is powerful, right? The ego can reassert itself in working with others. And it can unbalance you. So you're right. It, it can. And I have seen that. But in the same breath, it's, it's one of the ways you got to navigate and get back on balance and talk to your pillars and fucking take advice and, and hope for the best, right? And rely on God. And like, you know, there's not like one exact way that this works every single time for every single person. I know for me, I jumped the harder into helping others. I have never stopped. I've never stopped since like six months in or eight months in. I've sponsored eight to 10 guys all the time for seven years. And for me, I think it's benefited me more than you can fucking shake a stick at. I, I love it. To me, it helped me grow. And I still do it seven years later. Other people, they're like, fuck, I, I can't do that. I need to balance my life. I, I learned that I don't balance my own life. <laughs> I ask God for balance. When I try to balance my life, I'm prying and twisting and trying to fucking do something for my own self-satisfaction. I have to rely on God's balance, his guidance. I sit quietly and I ask him what my next step should be, like it says in On Awakening. I don't fucking ask God, give me the strength so I can show you, God, what my next step is to be. I, I rely on his power. You show me. And if I'm listening, dude, fuck, I'll get the answers. And the more that I clear the channel out of step 10, because step 10 is massively important in this whole thing. If I'm not doing step 10s, I won't get the answers I need from fucking God. I'm going to get fucking my own answers that sound like God, but they're based on what I fucking want. You're welcome. Okay, let's finish this reading. So this takes us out of ourselves. And it cures the imperious urge. When to yield would mean to heartache. If we have been through, if we have been thorough about our personal inventory, we have written down a lot. We have listed and analyzed our resentments, 
listed and analyzed. So anyone here who's reading step fives or listening, doesn't say just read it, it says written and analyzed. Analyzed is important. We're trying to pick these things apart. We're looking for self. We're looking for forgiveness. We're looking for where the other people are emotionally, spiritually sick, frequently wrong, so we can manufacture forgiveness. There's many reasons why we analyze these resentments. We have begun to comprehend their futility and their fatality. We have commenced to see the terrible destructiveness. We have begun to learn tolerance, patience, and goodwill towards all men. And I love that because as you analyze these resentments, you start building tolerance, patience, and goodwill towards these people because you're seeing them from a different light because you're analyzing them. But if you just read that shit out, you don't fucking change your perspective on it. Go ahead. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. That's, yeah, exactly. And like when I do step fives, typically, you know, we talk about the resentment prayer, save me from being angry, God, blah, 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 in that step four. Almost never do I need to like really give the resentment prayer to the sponsees I work with because I fucking manufactured so much forgiveness by re analyzing the resentments. And I analyze the resentments like I'll spend five hours on three or four resentments at the beginning. And usually it's your mom, your dad, your brother, you know, all these people that you're close to have, we got the biggest resentments too, but not always. Um, sometimes it's people that have harmed us. But once we analyze these resentments and we fucking really see that sometimes the people that we're resentful at, they fucking had a terrible life too. And they were only repeating shit that was done to them, whether it was our parents or somebody else or whatever. And as we analyze these resentments, we start going, holy fuck. And then we start looking at some of the things that we've done to our kids maybe, right? Maybe we fucking smacked our kids. Maybe we've told them like they're little fuckers. Maybe, who knows? But then we're like, holy shit. I speak of intolerance of this person while I'm intolerant to my own fucking kids. Maybe not even at the same level, but still. Yeah, but you can't comprehend what we're talking about, right? You're trying to figure it out in your head. This isn't a figure out in your head program. This is a do the program and have the experience of God that has nothing to do with your intellectual mind. Forgiveness for me was fucking not even fathomable. <laughs> but I fucking, it works in my life today. And I have an experience that I could share, but I won't, where I forgave somebody for doing something terrible and I can't even believe I forgave them. That's not me. That's God. Yeah, so I just do the work and Yes. That acceptance will come with that. Yeah, like people try to figure this out. Like you don't figure this out. And all the work I do with people one on one, I don't I'm not there figuring shit out. I'm sharing experiences that I've learned, that I've had, that I've been through in my life, and I'm connecting to God when I'm doing this work, and I get the fucking answers. And it's not that I'm sitting there going, okay, fucking three plus three is fucking six. I'm fucking divide that by fucking two. And let's fucking come up with a logical answer here. That's what psychiatrists do. That's not what we do here. We fucking rely on love. And then we bring the love out to you. And when you get the love dope, the God dope, you'll be able to transmit that into all areas of your life. And once you're able to transmit love in the areas of your life, you'll transmit it into you. And all the guilt and shame that you fucking suffer that you take out on everybody else, you'll fucking fucking heal yourself with it. And it takes time. And the traumas and the issues that you have over time will reveal themselves when God knows you're ready for it. The thing with me, my opinion on trauma work, so many people go into the fucking pits of trauma and start stirring up shit they have no business stirring up. And then it makes the person worse and they don't know what to do with it because it's not here. It's in the fucking, it's in here and it's all fucked up. This program allows shit to come up to the surface when you're ready for it. And if you're keeping a clean house through the work of this program and you can keep a clean inner house through your 10s, 11s and 12s, when the shit comes up, you can deal with it. 
Because if your house isn't clean, the shit will deal with fucking you. And I've seen it fucking time and time again. And then we're picking up a drink or we're jumping off a fucking rope. So, on a good note, you're in the right place. This is where we get her done. But we don't get it done by sitting on our asses doing fuck all. There's work to do. So, you've written down a lot. We've listed and analyzed our resentments. We have begun to comprehend their futility and fatality. We have commenced to see their terrible destructiveness. Fuck yeah. We have begun to learn tolerance, patience, and goodwill towards men. Even our enemies. For we look on them as sick people. We have listed the people with whom we have hurt. Uh, sorry. We have listed the people we have hurt by our conduct. Step eight. We are willing to set these matters straight if we can in this book you will read again and again that faith did for us what we could not do for ourselves of myself michael michaeline i cannot do this of myself i cannot fucking do any of this shit that we do here creator fucking does this shit that's what this is saying we hope you are convinced that now god can remove whatever self-will is blocked you off from him if you have already made a decision to turn your will and your life over and an inventory of your grosser, grosser handicaps, step four, you have made a good beginning. That being said, you have swallowed some and digested some big chunks of truth about yourself. And then that means you've accepted some things that you don't fucking like about yourself. And until we accept the things that we don't like, we won't grow out of them. And pride has a really good way of fucking blocking that shit out and resisting it. Because I don't want to admit it. But whatever I resist is always going to persist. And the lesson is always placed back in front of me till I learn it. Just looks different. So anyway, let's take a break and then we'll come back and blast into a little bit of the... Thank you for tuning in to the UDR cast. We hope you have enjoyed this episode. The viewpoints and the opinions expressed today were solely of the individual sharing them. If you resonated with this episode, please follow us and share this link with anyone that may benefit from it. Please visit us at billward.life to see everything that we have going on. We can recover one person, one family, one community at a time.